Okay. Hello, everyone. And we are live with the International Space University Metavisionaries, Space Comics, Professor Ford. Good to be with you. Indeed. Likewise. It's an honor to be here. I'm just going to do the checks. All right. Indeed, likewise. All right, we are on. All right. Okay. Uh, we have some Maltese music selected by Professor Borge. Brand present. Uh, pre uh, such a pleasure to see you on there. Um, I hope you get to watch the rest of the live. Uh, so uh, great to see you. Excellent. All right. So uh, Joseph, tell us, how did you come about this particular song? Uh, this is a song during the time of the pandemic years, I believe, when, when right. time at home was a bit more frequent, perhaps. And I mean, it is, it is, I like songs that are moving, right? And, and, with a certain beat and rhythm. And the song's mm -hmm. name is actually Ritmu, which is rhythm in English. And I just like the song. Fantastic. Well, uh, welcome to uh, this live session, Professor Borg. Such a pleasure to uh, have you here, Joseph. We've been uh, uh, not uh, too long ago together out in UAE, so lots of things to discuss. Uh, Sira, thank you so much. Uh, great to have you on the live. Um, so let's get the show started. Uh, welcome. Firstly, I want to thank the International Space University for allowing us to host this session, uh, which is titled Exploring the Intersection of Healthcare, Space and Frontier Technologies. What does that mean? Uh, what is the role of healthcare in space? Uh, and most importantly, let's talk about some of the real projects like that you're going to learn from Professor Borge today. And of course, um, this is going to be tied in with Professor Borge coming to Oxford in November, where we will be hosting the first International Space University Space Medicine course in Oxford, November the 11th to the 16th. And we'll have some exciting feedback to share with some of the work uh, Joseph is doing. So uh, it's going to be fantastic. Now, we're going to start this session slightly different. Um, we're going to be using uh, ChatGPT uh, for some of this uh, initial discussion. But before that, Professor Borge, if you want to introduce yourself to the audience. Yes. Thank you, Asim. Thank you for the introduction. So myself, uh, I am an academic. I'm a professor at the University of Malta. Uh, and my work focuses mostly on molecular biology and genetics, very specifically on blood disorders like thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. Uh, but as of late, I also... Uh, explore these tools of next-gen sequencing and so all things connected to omics or multi-omics we call them uh, and as of late as of course you know I have a PhD student Christine Gutt who is a microbiologist and a biomedical scientist and together jointly we work on on one particular space bioscience project and this is testing or investigating the effects of space flight and microgravity on human skin tissue microbiomes. So, so this is something uh, which we have done for the past two and a half years. And of course, we've sent Malta's very first space experiment uh, on board the ISS way back in 2021. We have sent our second one last year in 2022, and we are sending our third one in five days time. So before we continue, let's show everybody what we're referring to. Uh, so I'm going to play this screen with our partners from Space Applications and Ice Cubes.
So congratulations. Uh, this is the next phase uh, uh, going. And um, what I'm going to do now is uh, let's talk about this and uh, let's see what uh, chat GPT also tells us about this uh, experiment. And in fact, the first couple of questions we're going to ask are going to come directly from there. So we tested with chat GPT. Does it know <laughs> what Project Malath is? And initially it told us it was not familiar. Then after a bit of research, uh, it found out actually it does know what it is. So, uh, Professor Boj, what you're reading here, does that sound accurate about what chat GPT is telling us about Project Malath? Let's see, let's see. Okay, so you can say, yes, indeed, it is, it is pioneered by us from the University of Malta. Of course, mm -hmm. ESA is one collaborating partner, so that is also true. Uh, there is one small error. We're not sending pancreatic cells from diabetic patients. But we're sending mm -hmm. skin microbiomes so that we know. But indeed, it is it is to study the effects of microgravity on the microbiomes. Uh, okay. So you can say so, so you can say, yeah, yeah. What we're going to ask now? Uh, what three questions would <laughs> you like to ask Professor Ball about Project Malice about? Let's see what we come back with. This sounds like the architect in Matrix. It does. It does. All right. So what were some of the most surprising and unexpected findings from the project and how might it impact uh, our understanding of diabetes in its treatment? OK. OK. So we'll take them one by one. We can, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We go one by one. Okay. So surprising or unexpected. So I think, as you know, a microbiome is a collection of bacteria. So there are roughly 20 or even more in a given sample. So, so some unexpected findings were that there, there were only a handful of bacteria that really behaved differently in space as opposed to earth or ground control. And these included the pathogenic bacteria uh, that, that play a very important part in infection of human skin. Uh, this work is also published. So it's available publicly. Maybe, maybe later on, uh, after this call, I can uh, p place a link to our article or published work. And you can see, you can see a number of microorganisms like Morganella morganei, Proteis mirabilis, so these are all bacteria which are very hardy or difficult and they are a big pain for diabetic patients. And these behave very differently in space. And when I say differently, they actually thrive or there are greater numbers in space as opposed to the skin tissue that was maintained on Earth uh, and also as compared to when the patient came to hospital the first time. So these bacteria actually thrived in that environment. And this is a very interesting finding for many reasons. One, it shows us how, uh, I, I could dare say the word intelligent or able to adapt to harsh environment, these bacteria are. And secondly, but of equal importance is when crewed missions to space will spend longer time in space possibly to Moon and Mars, then we have to really, really keep tabs of our own microbiomes in oral mucosa, in skin or gut, because if these, if these turn bad on you, on us, then it is a very big problem, uh, 450 kilometers out of Earth or beyond. Absolutely true. And, and, and Joseph, I've got to ask you, um, you know, there's a number of students who've been enrolling uh, with the ISU over the last uh, three decades. I mean, what do they have looking, you know, what do they look forward to when it comes to roles in space? And, and I'd like to ask from a context of, of medicine and, and healthcare. And also for those who are practicing uh, healthcare professionals, what opportunities are there when it comes to uh, roles in space and I also want you to differentiate from those that will happen outside the earth and also in the earth now I'm going to share another 
uh, feedback from our friend, uh, ChatGPT, who I just asked, you know, uh, to tell us a bit about uh, our roles in um, when it comes to the benefit of healthcare on the earth, utilizing space. One of the things it talks about is developing new technologies. It talks about the ability to conduct medical research in microgravity and yeah. monitoring and predicting disease outbreaks. But uh, aside from that, in your opinion, uh, from, you know, yes. coming from your career, yes. yeah. what made you think, so, you know what, I'm going to go into space? Yes. So, so it's an interesting question. So I think, and it still stands true. So I am first and foremost, I'm a biomedical scientist uh, who loves studying all things connected to life and especially human life. So that's where the biomedical aspect comes in. And when I say I enjoy studying, I like going down to the level or detail of DNA, genomics, cells, how they divide, uh, how they develop, are regulated, are controlled, so on and so forth. So I knew, I knew little about the use of space and uh, microgravity in the context of space. However, I should tell you how this all started, right? So when I was during the pandemic years, right, late 2019, early 2020, I was reading a collection of articles published in Cell Press. And the title of this collection of articles was The Biology of Spaceflight. That's it. And I was reading these articles. Uh, and one of these articles included a large number of tests that were done on NASA's twin study, Mark and Scott Kelly, by Chris Mason and, and Afshin Beheshti. I say hello to them from here. And I was reading how they use tools that I use, like genome sequencing and RNA profiling, extraction of DNA. So, so all of a sudden, I said, OK, so, so there are these tools which I use almost on a daily basis to ask questions here on Earth. And these same tools can be used on samples and material sent to space and back. So space and microgravity is like a section, a part of a laboratory that can be used, can be exploited. So I do, I do. I mean, I do visualize space for many reasons, but primarily, primarily, it is a glorified laboratory for me. The ISS orbiting around Earth, which is huge. It, it's as big as a stadium, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it is like, it is like, it is like, oh, there, there we see Thomas Pesca handling the mallet one cube. So you can see all around him, right? You can see all around him, all those boxes and cupboards. There you can see on the right hand side, you can see like a drawer coming out. And that drawer is the Ice Cubes facility. Ice Cubes stands for International Commercial Experiment. So this is driven by the space application services in Belgium, at Nordvik, in Netherlands, and, and in Belgium. Uh, and basically, this is like a section of a laboratory. I have my experiment in a cube, which I have the same replica experiment in my lab to, to ensure parallel and analog systems. And basically, on board the ISS, on board ISS, we plug in this cube, it comes to life. I mean, it, you, you power it up. We have a set of cameras, one, two, that can monitor the experiment. We have a small number of sensors to monitor temperature and the small, small other uh, things. Uh, and of course, we, we also have different LED lighting to, to, to switch on and off the light inside the, inside the experiment. And ultimately, ultimately, it is a huge learning opportunity for the people here on the ground to be able, first of all, there's a whole learning experience of building something and sending it to space. Secondly, it's a different game ball or game changer to communicate with your experiment, to talk with it, and to download data, which could be pictures or videos of your experiment, we can also, and we did, send inspirational messages by young kids and students and children. And we are able to open 
these messages in space and show them to everyone on Earth. So if we think that these kids are not able to send a message to their country, to the world, then we go out of Earth, out of the world, and shout the message from top to bottom. And I mean, I mean, I mean, space is an interesting avenue, right? People pay attention. Some people make jokes or laugh. Some people take it seriously. I think space serves its purpose because whatever it is, people who disagree with space research, people who really support space research, I think it instigates debate and discussion. And that is the most important thing of it all, that it facilitates... So it facilitates discussion. So here's a point I want to make uh, and, and, and see if you agree or disagree whilst your screen comes back to uh, uh, normal. <laughs> oh, I'm my God. Kind of right now. You talked about the process of building up to getting to space in the uh, first place and what that, yeah. uh, that environment can bring uh, and, and what advantage that has. Now, Firstly, I believe there's two things that have happened in this last uh, year or two. One is the advent of the metaverse. Second is now communities globally accepting and really realizing the power of AI. And I have a special guest like yourself. I'll bring on here with me. There we go. Uh, Hilda, Hilda. It's good to have you. you. You missed all the Hello. fun stuff. We talked about you while you were here, but fine. We said all kinds of things. Uh, and... and uh, you know, when we talk about the metaverse, I'm just going to show this screen. You talked about building. Now we have the opportunity. Now here, uh, this is an example of, for example, building a spacecraft. Now we've held a number of events. In fact, uh, International Space University was one of the first universities to venture in the metaverse. And if you look at here, um, this is actually, by the way, a nine-year-old trying to design a spacecraft. Okay. Now, combine this, the very fact that we can utilize a virtual environment to plan experiments, to deliver uh, skills, to help people train and uh, build capacity. Most importantly, you can test prototype before you send anything to space or in, in, in any case, try any piece of work. What kind of advantages does that bring, number one? And number two, with AI being part of it, what kind of uh, opportunities do you see? And that's a question for both of you. So Hilda, I'll let you go with that first as you've just rolled in, uh, just because I love putting you on the spot and, uh, uh, and, and wing it. That's what term me and uh, Hilda taught me this term, I'll just say. Uh, it's called wing it. Uh, it's part of the dictionary now. Hilda, fire away. Okay, so I think, and by the way, um, the cube that Yosef is and that is launching for Yosef uh, in a couple of days is actually also in the metaverse, um, and so I think it's fantastic. There it is. So you can actually enter it. You can see how it's built. Uh, you can see in advance. You can do what you were talking about, like rapid prototyping. You can collaboratively design and you can see it and people from different sites uh, that are on different spots uh, can all see it. Um, but also afterwards and during, you can actually um, see the results. You can uh, visualize the design, the, the, um, the data or the results. So I think all of that is possible. And then to, I mean, to bring that in this immersive um, and social environment, uh, I think, is, is just opening so many possibilities that did not exist uh, in the past. So uh, good evening to everybody. Happy to be here. But that would be my first uh, <laughs> <laughs> input. I fully right. agree. And, and, and just to continue with Hilda, I think the metaverse it is an amazing tool to sort of convey the message perhaps in a not conventional way, right? And I think the more the more fun and engaging things are, I mean, it's like a classroom style, right? I think yeah. people or, or good teachers find ways how to get the children or students immersed. And I think the metaverse excels 
and getting I will people. say this is just me trying to be cool with, uh, you know, uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just playing around with it to show you two that, you know, there's some intelligence behind this brain. I was looking cool <laughs> doing it. Amazing, amazing. And I think I think you touched you touched with a point, Wasim, where you mentioned simulations and also before doing the real deal, you can practice and play and assemble in this metaverse. And I think if the tools are serious enough and detailed enough, I think I think computer scientists, engineers, and other related professions can really make good use of this tool before proceeding uh, to the real deal. And this would be tantamount to a simulation after all, right? I mean, ultimately, we will see ourselves as digital twins running in simulation in this metaverse. I, I agree. And I think um, just for full transparency, I'm the one who's been using Wing It. Wing it. I've been blaming Hilda for it. But, you know, as, as everybody's coming out with definitions, I, I, it's fair. I mentioned that, uh, you know, we were all in Dubai. Uh, one of the fantastic things about this particular project, which involves all of us, uh, we're going to have people uh, sending artwork from around the world. But most importantly, we've got samples which come from different countries. Uh, we've got an astronaut coming from the UAE. Uh, we've got a scientist like yourself uh, the, the, who, you know, initiated this project uh, in, in Malta. And what a fantastic way of bringing different disciplines together, different communities together, and most importantly, the innovation and the advancement that can then be filtered into or, or, or within our healthcare practice on the earth itself. Diabetes is such a big issue where people are suffering globally. I mean, what do you see going forward in terms of uh, what you would like to see coming out uh, when the results come back from this particular experiment? So I think I think this would this would tie in with a question that I saw popping up on the comments. Yes. I, I forgot the name, and he mentioned, "Ah, this is it. This is it, right?" So, so indeed, what space offers, how the, how it affects the biological systems. So, the fact, the fact that there is microgravity, so cells in space are interacting together in a fateful manner, as they are sort of on Earth in a way, which is a more three D manner. So, this is like 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 all the cells or blood that we have ourselves when we do experiments in our labs at universities or hospitals all these cultured cells are grown in flasks and dishes petri dishes this is all in 2d manner so so the cell to cell contact that happens in the lab and the cell to cell contact that happens in a space context is much more faithful much more appropriate to study these interactions. Secondly, the, the environment of space is a very harsh one. There's a lot of solar background radiation, even on board the ISS. We all know that life in space, including astronauts, cannot spend more than a year in space because of uh, vision problems, blood problems, and space anemia, muscle loss, bone loss. So in space, life science or life science experiments are accelerated. They age faster. So the fact that we can arrive to a result faster in a matter of weeks or months as opposed to a year or longer, then in the context of life science, this is a game changer because we can identify biomarkers, target genes, important pathways, and all of these can be arrived faster. And the pharma industry, those who develop medicines, develop drugs, uh, create drugs based on information or literature or evidence. So all of this gets a fast track, if you like. And this is all to the benefit of humanity. So let's talk about that. You know, I, I qualified as a pharmacist um, uh, and... Uh, all the things you mentioned uh, and Hilda I'm going to come to you on this and then come back to you Joseph um, if you think about simulation and what role that could have played Joseph in, in when you were developing this experiment if you were able to prototype and prepare an environment like a metaverse if that was the case 
Hilda, the question from Ajit, uh, fantastic. Uh, had a great conversation with him this morning. Um, in a simulation, do you use a mix of physics-based modeling or more algorithms, or would it be a mix of both? Definitely a mix of both, I would say. I mean, and it really de depends also where we're thinking of what we're simulating. But I mean, Joseph is, of course, talking about uh, the biological aspects, but we can also think of what it um, what it has as impact if we uh, do material study, for example, in under microgravity conditions. And then it's very interesting to see what we can a model uh, based on, on physical uh, physics uh, equations, basically. Um, but also, I mean, we, we also talk about with the Space Innovation Labs to um, make sure that we provide access to Earth observation data, for example. Then, I mean, algorithms, uh, application of algorithms on how to process those Earth observation data and, and turn it into um, applications or operational um, data that can be used to make decisions and so on. I mean, it's also very interesting. So yeah, I would absolutely say I'm a mix of, of the two uh, and, and apply the one that is most relevant for the, the purpose we want to achieve. Yeah. Now, um, you, you mentioned on the Space Innovation Labs, so we've got some fantastic announcements, Joseph and Hilda, coming up in the coming days. Uh, and uh, uh, International Space University have very much been a part of this process. Um, uh, one of the questions uh, we've been asked is, uh, in what capacity do you envision the metaverse contributing to the role of space education? Um, I want to uh, play this uh, uh, video with Professor James, uh, Dr. James Green, who was the former chief scientist of NASA, uh, a hardcore uh, faculty, ISU faculty member, who you will see in SSPs to SH, SSHPs uh, uh, with ISU. Um, and this is an example for me with ingenuity, what space education or any type of education can benefit Earth. from the metaverse. And so each and every one of those plays an important role. Now we can show and visualize on the rover itself what those systems are like. Now, having someone like Jim or, or, or you know, having some of these experts from around the world, you can have them in the metaverse. You can have uh, realistic uh, visuals like you're seeing with the rover. Uh, and, and most importantly, um, the other advantage now with the metaverse uh, environment and the way AI is playing is the personalization of learning. What do you both feel about that in terms of, uh, you know, when we think about education and we think, you know, you have 30 students or in a classroom, one mode of teaching. Now we have the ability to educate, collaborate, prototype and uh, simultaneously build all together linked to something like we've talked about a space innovation lab which is physically on the ground giving you access to the iss um and and it's all linked together joseph what do you think yeah, and then we'll come to help so, so whilst we're talking i just thought of something right so so i should state this right so so myself i still am a believer of somewhat traditional traditional teaching so to say right uh, where where people students are required uh, are warranted to listen to listen to someone who has progressed through the years and is is how do you say bestowing upon them or telling them uh, some important concepts and and ideas and projects or, or whatnot. However, however, and you see this. So generally, when there is a class and the number of students the best part of being a teacher or, an, or a lecturer or an academic is to see them working together, collaborating and coming up with a project. Now, if you had to think about this and you think about the metaverse idea where you can have, not possibly, but realistically, different schools or organizations or entities who are in separate parts of the world, the States, Africa, Europe, Far East, wherever. And these classes or groups of people, instead of all of them having to travel and join in a hall or, or some sort, uh, these, these, these groups can meet realistically in the metaverse 
and are able to keep on working as a group, but are also able to mix and mingle and talk and discuss. And I mean, all of a sudden, you have opened up the culture, the system, people based in all different parts of the continents, and you've just placed them in a metaverse context. This is not like a, like a Zoom call, a Teams, where you fill the whole screen of different passport uh, size pictures, right? But you have people walking around in a virtual environment, but are still able to talk. So one can say that this is like a mixed multiplayer online game, but this is purely science and, and educational. So if done well, it can reap many benefits, I believe. So uh, as I said, we've got, by the way, Hilda, you don't know this. We, you missed quite a bit, you see. You missed the video of the cube and the space apps. You missed our friend Chat GPT, who's involved in this conversation. Uh, so so you so see, you're missing a lot here. So let, let's go to what Chat GPT tells us. So the question I asked was, what role can AI and Metaverse play with space innovation labs in the future of learning? So we had these answers. We had AI-powered learning. Uh, AI can be used to personalize learning experience and provide individual feedback. Uh, you could tailor learning experiences to the needs of the individual students, simulation and training in the metaverse, collaborative research and development. Hilda, do you agree? <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> of course I do. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, to uh, say something to what Joseph was saying. And on the one hand, I absolutely uh, see, and I I saw that um, there was um, uh, now I lost it in the in the comments. But Sage on stage. Uh, so I wanted to comment to that. Look, like on the one hand, I think it's yeah, thanks. I think it's fantastic if indeed people that gained experience and hopefully also some wisdom. Uh, with the color of the hairs that they can pass on uh, some of their wisdom and experience. But I think also, I mean, at the same time, it's a disadvantage because these people have been trained uh, sometimes decades ago and they have not necessarily confronted themselves with all that is happening on all the diff in you know, all the different sectors and all the new that is happening. And I think that's also where, I mean... Um, an environment like the metaverse can allow to bring all of these voices, generation and confrontations together um, to bring us, I mean, further in the sense of what your friend Chad GPT was, was saying, like, uh, I mean, how do we arrive to innovation is by, uh, by bringing ideas together and confront them and see what the creativity and the sparks lead to. And that, I think, is really um, also what metaverse environment can really contribute to. Now, um, I, I want to uh, kind of uh, focus down on um, the opportunity for people from uh, healthcare who aren't necessarily involved with space. Um, I'd like to know, you know, a lot of the one of the questions we get asked is, uh, for example, we're doing this space medicine course this year. We're doing a team project with the ISU in Brazil. Um, you know, if, if you're a pharmacist or a doctor or a nurse, really, how do you get involved with space? Say you do a, a space medicine course, what's next? Or is it that it's not necessarily what will happen today, but what will happen in the next two to five years where, uh, you know, we're going to get these exponential opportunities to work within these sectors? Yes. So so maybe if I, if I can mention, so for sure, for sure, because I know, Hilde knows, and people who work in the sector know as well, that space science, which includes bioscience, physics, and chemistry, but, but specifically bioscience, this is going through a renaissance period of huge increase of interest, specifically by scientists, and who have an interest in, in bioscience. Now, nurses, pharmacists, medical doctors would really, really be helping a lot when people such as myself, my students or others who are going to the ward, to clinics and health centers, and when they ask for 
patient recruitment, patient material. Of course, everything is done with ethical approval and informed consent. But should the project have all the right credentials, nurses and doctors and pharmacists, if they contribute by helping, facilitating the project, by offering their service and their help, then that's it. Truth be told, truth be told, they are already part of the project that way. If, if they want to do more and they wish to lead a project, then whereas before it wasn't very easy, it was very difficult, now it's getting easier and easier uh, because of the many opportunities. So we speak about the ISS, but as we speak, there are at least four or five different orbital space stations that are being built. And by the end of this decade, before 2030 or around 2030, there will be additional orbiting space stations. Hilde will tell us more about this as well. Uh, so the opportunities are increasing really, really exponentially, I would say. Hilda, um, going on what Joseph has said, uh, and, and this is a question, why should investors consider the relationship between healthcare and space? Yeah, I think, I mean, the space environment has so much potential in contributing in an accelerated and innovative way to healthcare applications. Um, and so we see, for example, in the whole cell culturing, I mean, 3D, three-dimensional cell culturing is easier um, in, under microgravity conditions. So that allows what, what Joseph was also referring to that, I mean, for example, pharma companies can, can see uh, that this might lead to accelerated processes for drug testing. Um, and so I think that has a lot of uh, application potential um, I mean, in the drug development, drug testing, uh, but larger than that, there, there are so many uh, applications that uh, can uh, be based on, on the uniqueness of, of the space environment. And so specifically, I see there a lot of um, application potential that uh, can also be very much of interest to, uh, to investors. I mean, uh, one example could be organoids. Organoids are, are mini organs that have the same functions as our uh, our body's organs. Um, more and more pharma companies are, are looking into using these for, um, for yeah, their applications. And so imagine bringing those into a space environment that helps them uh, to sustain themselves without having to need uh, the same level of, of what is called scaffolding that you need on Earth. I mean, it's really, yeah, there's a large potential of R&D applications um, that I think are definitely of interest also for uh, for investors. Now, um, one of the things here uh, uh, Sir talks about is getting involved with organizing on recruit user, US citizens, and, and I think you're referring to NASA here. But one of the things we've discussed uh, and, and uh, we have are talking about this network of space innovation labs uh, that give you access regardless of whether you're part of one country or another. Hilda, let's talk about that and, and how, Joseph, you set up the one in Malta with uh, Hilda and her team and how we collectively now are building this global network of space innovation labs, what we envision for them. Uh, and of course, uh, we, we've got the pleasure of having uh, ISU uh, uh, being involved in this. Uh, Hilda, tell us what is a space innovation lab what you see as the use cases and Joseph, how you were actually able to work with Hilda and build one and as resulted in this and how a whole network of these around the world could actually answer what Sirat has asked there in terms of uh, access to space and the advantages. Yeah, so as you, as you mentioned, what we're setting up is a global network of these space innovation labs. And so this is 
physical infrastructure, physical hubs, you could say, on the ground in different locations spread over all the continents, <laughs> not, not just the uh, US or any other. We're, by the way, all European based, so uh, we, we get access. Um, and so these space innovation labs are connected with space, with space infrastructure, so they have access to space. They're connected to the metaverse and to the mixed reality um, environments. And so it allows uh, people to access infrastructure hands-on. It allows people to access capacity building. Um, it allows people to get involved in space missions, in uh, space experiments, space-related data. Uh, and that's really the purpose of what we are trying to set up with this network. It's exactly what um, Sirat, and I don't know if I, know, I pronounce your name correctly, but what, what you are mentioning is to bring it to people's fingertips, to bring it to their doorstep. That's exactly okay. what we want to do with the global network of space innovation labs and linking it uh, to the metaverse so that really everybody can engage and be part of it. Exactly. So Joseph, I, 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 to... echo, I echo Hilda's uh, points exactly. Uh, and yes, so 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 how, how I did all this. So I, I could mention, right? So at the same time, this, this is amazing. At the same time that I was reading about the, the uh, cell collection, uh, the, the published articles in cell, and around about the same week, I would say, I had received an email, uh, sorry, a LinkedIn message, a LinkedIn message by Space, Space Application Services, one of the employees, the name escapes me, but he was really, maybe Hilda, you can remind me, who was the person? Nicola. <laughs> Nicola, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Nicola, uh, I, say, I say hello from here when he, see, when he hears this. And it was a simple, it was a very, very simple, almost sales type of message. Like, listen, you know, we are a company, we send missions to space. If you ever... It, <laughs> this is amazing. It's like going to the supermarket, right? Like if you ever need to send something to space, like you can think of us and we can discuss. And it so happened because I was reading the articles and they said, actually, I do wish to send something to space. So, so can we talk more? Can we discuss more? I said, sure. Yes, of course. And that's it. So from there, we organized, we organized a very first uh, call uh, with Hilda and eventually a number of other uh, members of the team. Uh, and from that call, I mean, it was really seamless how my ambition and, and designs of the experiment and how the setup by ice cubes and space applications within Belgium, how the setup was readily available i mean i mean it was it was it was a smooth ride so and how i did it how i did it as an academic and a scientist i am convinced that any other academic or scientist who sees either a need or else understand really the benefit of sending an experiment in the context of microgravity and a harsh environment and an increase in solar radiation, so on and so forth. And I mean, the options are limitless because whether you want to send an experiment for a short time, whether you want to send an experiment for a long time, whether you want to send an experiment and attach that outside of the ISS, because there is also a way to do that, or else use a facility that space applications own on board the, the ISS. I mean, the options are endless. And so, so I, I would recommend to anyone who wants to, 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 to send an experiment to space. I mean, I mean, you will seek and you will find. I like that, yeah. you will seek and you will find. I mean, Hilda, the process of um, uh, Connecting education now, as you know, with the International Space University, they have the space studies program. They have the executive space courses. They have the Southern Hemisphere uh, space studies program uh, out in Australia. 
And for decades now, they have been developing uh, a whole generation of uh, space engineers and scientists and uh, coming through their system. I mean, surely now with this push in uh, frontier technologies, um, you know, how, how, how do you see um, the education component changing and how you see space innovation labs fitting with this whole concept of education similar to what ISU has been doing and you know we we don't know what we don't know but but where do you go with this in terms of really revolutionizing uh, the workforce now i think um i mean the international space university for me has two very strong um assets and one is uh, the international um uh, aspect bringing together all these people from all around the world. The other one um, that I think is very strong is the interdisciplinary. Um, and they have been doing that actually for quite a long time. Um, they're bringing people from very, very different sectors together in some of these courses that you mentioned. And that's, uh, and, and I like that comment that Dr. Leandra made that at the end, space is not uh, that much of a separate entity. Uh, than, than Earth, and uh, that's exactly what I think. That slowly, um, what we are, what we have created on Earth, uh, in terms of economy, in terms of culture, and it links also to Aisha's question in terms of art and so on. That slowly, we as humankind are expanding that. Not just our technology of how we launch a rocket into space and how we build infrastructure technologically, but also really the more, I mean, the, all of the other discipline aspects like art and so on. And that for me is really uh, fantastic where we are today is that these different aspects and different disciplines are brought together and we need all of those uh, in space. We need these artists, we need architects, we need biomedical people, we need um, nurses, we need surgery, uh, I mean, and, and so on. We need AR people, we need artificial intelligence people. So all of these disciplines, they all uh, come together. And that I think is, is really fantastic. And I think that's what uh, ISU has been doing um, since, since quite a while. And, and again, how that we can bring all of that together uh, in the space environment, in the space innovation labs and in the metaverse. Absolutely. So we're going to uh, approach that hour. It's been a fantastic conversation. So we're going to tie this up. Um, Joseph, uh, you're going to be out there with us in November, uh, leading up to this next quarter where we have so many fantastic things going on. Uh, uh, tell us about when uh, Project Manath launches next week, uh, yes. what we expect, uh, and then uh, when you expect to get the results. Yes. So I think the major highlights would be that next Tuesday, uh, there is the launch by SpaceX CRS-27. So it's a resupply mission that, that SpaceX uh, is contracted by NASA. This will launch from Cape Canaveral in Florida, and it will dock a day later. A day later. Um, once docked, all the experiments uh, are, are, of course, uh, removed from, from the SpaceX Dragon capsule, are placed inside the ISS, and the, the Mallet 3 BioCube or Science Cube will be installed by the Emirati astronaut, Sultan Al Nayadi, and it will be installed a couple of days later, so around about 17th March. That will be a historical milestone because there are some surprises as well upon the installation of the cube itself. Uh, Sultan Al Nayadi is actually also uh, doing a demo that all the world and all the public will get to see and will understand as well. Uh, the experiment itself, just like Mallet 1 and Mallet 2, so on board the ISS, not much is happening in terms of genetics and genomics because the work is done before the launch and after the launch. Uh, during, during the BioCube on board the ISS, we'll be having a number of events that I will encourage the people uh, viewing this to keep tabs and see our posts that we will do, uh, most of which connected with art or music or some important events of streaming from ISS uh, to Earth. Ultimately, uh, the, the CRS-27 
will come back to Earth, I believe, after a month and a month and a half. So it will drop back to the Atlantic Ocean. From there, it will go back to the States. And from there, a courier delivery to our labs in Malta. And we can continue uh, the experiments in our labs. And ultimately, this all ties in in the, in the genomics and personalization of healthcare to identify key biomarkers that can be used either prognostically or as therapeutic uh, measures for people suffering with diabetic foot ulcers. That's it. Wonderful. Um, Hilda, uh, last words on uh, what we're planning to do over the coming uh, quarter uh, with uh, establishing the space network of space innovation labs globally. Uh, looking forward to the International Space University very much being a part of that and, and working with us in delivering uh, the, the curricula and the courses. And of course, we've got our uh, next Pioneer Lab uh, that's going to be uh, opening in Kaust in uh, under a quarter. Um, so, so I'd love for you to, to sum up some of these things and then we'll wrap it up. Yep, indeed, you already mentioned a lot. So I, I mean, Mallet, I think is, is fantastic. It's a, for us now a symbol and a pilot of what we're setting out in the, in the next months to do. I mean, it's a symbol of the scientific collaboration, of the international collaboration that we want to um, set up through the global network of these space innovation labs that we are uh, starting in, in eight locations now. Um, it also carries, as, as Joseph was explaining, the digital artwork, and I think we all feel strongly that it's connected to art, to uh, entertainment, to um, uh, education, of course, as well. Um, it's connecting, uh, Mallet is connecting already to some of these uh, initial space innovation labs, and it serves um, the, the purpose of using the, the environment of space for Earth benefit, in this case for, for diabetes. So I, I love that we have this, um, this uh, small cube that has so many different dimensions and carries so much uh, wealth now. Uh, and yeah, we will much look forward to everything that will happen in the, in the next couple of months in terms of installing these space innovation labs, in terms of continuing uh, sessions in the metaverse, capacity building, um, and bringing in more um, people, more entities uh, into into the network. Uh, so it's a very, very exciting time and happy that uh, International Space University is, of course, also part of this uh, whole setup. Right. So um, I really want to uh, thank you, Joseph. Uh, always a pleasure. We've got a lot to do. Uh, we will drive uh, Hilda crazy together and uh, it's going to be great uh, so Hilda unfortunately of course uh, decided to uh, connect with us with her number and now I'm sure she regrets it uh, uh, but, but, but just for you to all know um, so we have an executive space course that ISU is going to be delivering in just under a month uh, in Strasbourg you have the space studies program 23 going to be held in Brazil and uh, it's going to be a fantastic program in fact the first metaverse team project led by jim green is going to be there uh, and then of course we have the executive space medicine course the first in oxford in november uh yes to one of the questions jacinda feel free to reach out to us uh to talk about um uh, that particular course and and how you could get involved uh, and with that, um, I want to say a big, big thank you to ISU for letting us host this. I'm hoping to host a lot more. Uh, you know, they've been a fabulous organization, really delving and building this fantastic network. And I think it's only going to increase now that, uh, you know, we, we, we realize um, uh, the context. And, and just a context I want to say, um, you know, and, and I say this so often, we know changes here. We know it's rapid. We know it's exponential. But through the lens of space, we can stay on top of it. We can stay ahead, right? You might find something you learn today or an industry today is completely disrupted in eight months. But this is why space is so important because that's the one industry that still has some way to go. And in fact, it will never stop. The innovation, in fact, for me, is the ultimate goal of innovation that will lead back to here is if you're thinking, why space? I mean, why not? What's left to explore except the infinite? 
And with that, I'm going to say good night. I'm going to play another sound from uh, Professor Borges' collection. Uh, Jim Green, you're not on here. And so you're not winning this title, unfortunately. You, you missed out. Uh, but, but here we go. So I'll play this. And there we go. There we go. And uh, with that, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. I'd love for Hilda and Joseph, if you can stay off for a few seconds uh, whilst I end the broadcast. Thank you so much. It was an amazing audience, amazing questions. Shout out to ISU, Space Labs, Ice Cubes, Hilda, Joseph, Space Omic, and the Metavision. Good night. See you soon.